first, can you just say your name and what you do? My name is Julie Willis. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. Julie, I'd like to start by asking you to describe Melbourne in a few sentences or adjectives to someone who's not familiar with the city. Well, Melbourne is really a 19th century city. It's one that's of the uh, of colonial past, but it's a city of surprises, of hidden ge gems, of places to discover. It's quite a lot of fun to be in if you know where you're going. Awesome. Thanks for that. So let's start with the early days of Melbourne. 1835, the first European settlement gets created and soon after, Robert Hoddle, the senior surveyor from Sydney, comes up with the original city grid that till today, I guess, carries his name. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that grid. And if I get this right, that's where today's central business district of Melbourne is, is located. Is it right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, Melbourne was settled by uh, pastoralists coming across from Tasmania in 1835, um, but they bandied together and uh, asked the government in Sydney to come and establish a formal settlement. Uh, and that started in 1836. And as part of that, uh, there was the sale of land. Now we could go on about the indigenous inhabitants and how the dispossession of their lands occurred and it, um, it doesn't have a very uh, nice history of that. Um, so I am acknowledging that there was dispossession and a lot of uh, conflict and uh, unhappiness, uh, probably putting it mildly for the local indigenous peoples when this occurred. Um, but with the arrival of government, essentially, uh, the land was divided up by survey and Robert Hoddle was asked to lay out the survey in Melbourne. It followed a set of guidelines that had been laid down in Sydney in, uh, I think it's 1822. Uh, and it, it dictated that uh, there needed to be a town layout uh, was oriented to the topography of the land. So the grid lies in a saddle between two hills and the center point of it, there's a little creek that runs down it, um, so a valley. Uh, and that it was to be laid out with um, certain requirements as to block sizes and street sizes, uh, all laid out in these guidelines, uh, which is what Hoddle did, um, laid it out and therefore enabled the land to be sold um, and importantly sold to investors who'd never seen it in the long run. It's still kind of uh, in, intact or has it been changed throughout the years? No, it's certainly intact. So the original uh, layout was a series of 24 blocks laid in a pattern of three blocks by eight blocks. Uh, as an extra layer of eight blocks was added uh, and then um, but that sits in a town reserve of a three by one mile uh, reserve. So Melbourne's grid is oriented on an angle to the cardinal points, the compass, um, and that's because it aligns with the river. Uh, and then there's a lot of parkland that sits around it and they, that town reserve is, is part of that parkland. And then you have what were called suburban blocks that sat outside that town reserve. So the characteristics of Melbourne from that very early layout are still absolutely evident. Um, and in fact, that's what dictates uh, what we think of as the central district for Melbourne and what we think of as suburban areas. Is it true that the white streets of the grid were designed to be 99 feet wide so that the 16 horse carriage can make a U-turn? <laughs> I haven't heard that, but yes, they are 99 feet wide and it's got a lot more to do with the making sure that there is sufficient breeze to come through and vent the city because the time the miasma theory of disease uh, held that bad smells conveyed disease. So it's a health thing rather than a convenience thing for your carriage. Uh, moving on, uh, mid 1980, uh, sorry, mid 1850s, and um, well, the gold gets rediscovered around Melbourne, and the city 
gets quite quite rich pretty fast it transforms very fast certainly and my question here is uh, is twofold what impact did gold rush have on the urban planning and architecture of um, melbourne and how did the city cope with such significant and fast growth i understand thousands of Im immigrants were arriving daily that's absolutely true so gold is discovered in 1851 uh, it's not discovered immediately in Melbourne, it's discovered in places that are around 100 kilometres plus away from Melbourne. Uh, and because of that discovery, there are hundreds of thousands of immigrants who come through. They come through Melbourne as a port, but they also come through Melbourne's second city, Geelong, as a port as well. Uh, and in those very early days, there are actually not as many people in Melbourne because they're all out digging for gold, looking for their fortune. Um, but it coincided with um, the colony of Victoria being separated from New South Wales. So about a month before gold was found, the separation of the colony occurred. So gold fuels the colony of Victoria's ambition and we see huge buildings being created at this time, treasury building, um, plans for Parliament House, the custom building is rebuilt. They are very, very grand edifices at this time. University is uh, created, the State Library and Museum is created. And indeed, those two buildings are the sites of the early trades, uh, trade union movement, where um, there were protests to create the eight hour working day. So some of the earliest unionized protests in the world were because of the gold rush um, in Melbourne. But let's move on to the mid of the 20th century. A lot of steel and glass high rise skyscrapers reach into, into the sky. The skyline is changing, the city is changing. And uh, I understand that Melbourne currently has the largest number of skyscrapers than any other Australian city. What are some other unique characteristics of M Melbourne's urban planning? Well, we have a, a grid layout that we've been talking about, which has big streets, the 99 feet wide streets, but it also has little streets. And they are literally called little streets. So you have Collins Street and Little Collins Street. You have Burke Street, you have Little Burke Street. Uh, and they are only 66 feet wide and they create a much more intimate atmosphere in the city. And threaded through all of those blocks are lots of little laneways and arcades. Uh, so the city is both a, a city that can you can get to very easily. The grid allows for transport lines and we have all of our trams that have never been taken away, just like European cities. Uh, so it, it's a, a city that's very easy to get around. But once you get away from the big streets, you're in these much more intimate spaces that are, are full of small cafes and tiny shops. Um, it feels very creative, very lively, um, and very exciting and intense. Um, in a way, many 19th century planned cities are not. So Melbourne has all these different scales that are really exciting um, and create interesting places. My favorite question now, I'd like to ask you, Julie, about some of your favorite architectural hidden gems that certainly deserve to be seen, but perhaps don't get the attention that they deserve. And around that, I know you did extensive research and wrote a book about women architects in Australia in the first half of the 20th century. And I was wondering if there are any stories or works that particularly stand out from that research that can be seen in Melbourne. So the, the history of women architects is also a history of the development of the profession. So women are often working in um, with other people, uh, male architects. Uh, so there, it's actually difficult to attribute lots of buildings to women's work alone. But the very large Royal Melbourne Hospital, which sits to the north of the city, uh, was um, well had a, a woman architect who was its job captain and partner in charge. Uh, her name was Ellison Harvey and uh, largely responsible for the success of that building. Um, very strategic building when it was completed in 1942, it was taken over by the US Army 
um, uh, to support the war effort um, uh, the, in the Pacific in particular. Uh, so very strategic building. Um, and there are other women who worked on different hospital sites also in East Melbourne. Uh, Molly Turner Shaw was involved in the Mercy Hospital as was Ellison Harvey. Uh, so the, the, just the history of hospitals is a good way to think about uh, the, hist the involvement of women in architecture in Australia. Um, one of the hidden gems would be uh, the Lyceum Club, a women's only club that sits in Ridgeway Place in Melbourne. Um, always designed by women architects and even the work that they have going on more recently is designed by women architects. So a space for uh, professional women, all designed by women, um, it's a little hidden away. Um, but they're just some of the uh, sort of uh, women associated works that might be of interest to people. Any other hidden gems you'd recommend for visitors not to miss? Look, I think that you, you need to capture the sort of uh, madness of some of Melbourne's architecture, uh, madness in a good way. Uh, it's really worth having a walk down Collins Street to see some of the 1880s and 1890s high Victorian architecture, very decorated, very coloured. Um, so particularly the Older Fleet and Rialto buildings are really wonderful to look at. Uh, but there are some amazing internal spaces that are left. The former Stock Exchange building next to the ANZ Bank on the corner of Queen and Collins Street has the Stock Exchange floor, which you can walk in to see and see all the fantastic encaustic tiles and marble um, and a wonderful um, retreat on a freezing winter's day, I can say, when I, I'm walking around the city. Uh, the arcades are really worth looking at and certainly exploring from shopping. But it's always worth looking at Melbourne's contemporary architecture as well. So the buildings, particularly around RMIT University on Swanston Street, uh, which are infusions of colour and reference and quite confronting um, architecture that uh, really draws on postmodern aesthetic and beyond. Uh, are really worth having a look at. Maybe not to your taste, uh, but certainly encapsulating something about the uh, the experimentation that covers, uh, is very prevalent in Melbourne architecture. That, that's wonderful. Great recommendations, Julie. Thanks for that. One last question, if you have um, one more minute to, to stay on. So Melbourne has been, in the past decade or two, consistently voted as one of the most livable cities in the world for, for a number of years, I think it was the most livable city in the world. So tell us, Julie, is it really so wonderful to live in Melbourne? And if so, why? I'm born and bred in Melbourne, so I am biased, but it's a fantastic city. Um, it's, it's a very cultural city. It's an engaged city. It's a city that's got life in it from morning till night. Uh, I've been stopped on the street in Melbourne uh, on a Sunday afternoon and people saying, is it really this busy all the time? And you go, well, yes. And they can't believe that it has this life right in the centre, in the in the business districts of the city, uh, and that there are people on the streets and events going on. Um, there's always something new to eat. There's always something new to experience. Um, and it's in some ways in COVID times, it's been so sad to see our city empty and we hope to see it coming back in this lively and exciting way that has become what Melbourne is. And the other thing is that it's a lovely place to live because uh, you have good transport, you have great food, you have uh, a safe city, um, you have good weather. Uh, all of that makes for a really fantastic place to live. I recommend it. Yeah, I testify to that. I've been to Melbourne and I think the city is great. Uh, Julie, that's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, sharing your insights here. I wish you all the very best with your projects at the faculty and, and outside. And uh, thanks again for taking time. That's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.